Hello, my name is Andrew Grand. I'm a neurosurgeon at the University of Minnesota. Today I'm going to talk to you about cerebral spinal fluid made simple. Here you can see an artistic depiction of the ventricular system. The ventricular system is essentially composed of the lateral ventricles, which connect to the third ventricle through the foramen of Monroe, which then connects to the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct. Here's another depiction of the ventricular system overlaid on top of the human brain. The lateral ventricle is composed of the frontal horn, the body, the trigone, occipital horn, and then the temporal horn. The characteristic C shape of the lateral ventricle is seen here. The lateral ventricle is connected through the foramen of Monroe to the third ventricle. The third ventricle is a midline structure, which is then connected to the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct. The fourth ventricle is located posterior to the brain stem and anterior to the cerebellum. Cerebral spinal fluid flows throughout the system and into the fourth ventricle and then exits through the foramen of Lushka out lateral or the foramen of Magendi which is medial to enter the cerebral spinal fluid space. It is then collected within the venous system and returned to the heart. Alternatively cerebral spinal fluid will traverse into the central canal of the spinal cord where it eventually collects in the lumbar cistern and then is recirculated again through the venous system of the brain. On the left you can see the ventricular system which is depicted in blue. The choroid plexus is depicted in red. The choroid plexus is the site of origin of cerebral spinal fluid. In the upper right hand corner you can see a slide that has been prepared demonstrating the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus has been stained and is visible within the ventricle. In the bottom right corner is a depiction of the choroid plexus and the production of cerebral spinal fluid. One can see how the arterial goes into the capillary plexus. Fluid is then transferred from the blood system and into the cerebral spinal fluid space, crossing the ependema. <clears throat> I'm going to describe now the anatomy of the lateral ventricle. The lateral ventricle is seen in the depiction on the right. The ventricular system is in blue and the lateral ventricle is the C-shaped structure that is seen in both hemispheres. The lateral ventricle is lateral to the third ventricle and is connected to the third ventricle through the foramen of Monroe which again can be seen in this depiction on the right. The lateral ventricle is divided into the frontal horn, which is anterior to the foramen of Monroe. The body is posterior to the foramen of Monroe. And <clears throat> rests above the thalamus. This is very important surgically when we approach lesions within the, third, within the lateral ventricle. It's important to recognize that inferior or below the floor of the third ventricle is the thalamus. And this can be easily injured when approaching various tumors in this region. In the picture on the bottom right, you can see choroid plexus, which is on top of the floor of the third ventricle. The choroid plexus can be seen in this image as it courses forward 
and through the foramen of Monroe into the third ventricle. The atrium is posterior to the body of the, or the atrium is another component of the lateral ventricle, and it lies posterior to the body of the lateral ventricle. In the picture on the right, the atrium is seen, and it is the junction of the body, the occipital horn, and the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. Meningiomas of the ventricular system oftentimes arise within this region, and as such, this is a region that is commonly approached in some tumor surgeries. A typical approach for this procedure would be through the parietal lobe going through the brain and into the atrium. The occipital horn is also a part of the lateral ventricle and extends posteriorly from the atrium and into the occipital lobe of the brain. The temporal horn lies within the temporal lobe. This is a very important structure as the hippocampus forms the medial border of the temporal horn. This is seen in the bottom right picture. One can see the hippocampus with the head, the body, and the tail. The head of the hippocampus has a very characteristic appearance that looks like a lion's foot. Also one can appreciate how the hippocampus forms the inferior and medial wall of the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. When doing a temporal lobectomy, a typical approach is through the middle gyrus of the temporal lobe and one identifies the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. At this point one then directs their attention to removing a part of the hippocampus when performing this procedure for the treatment of epilepsy. Moving on to the third ventricle, the third ventricle is a medial structure. This is apparent on the image on the left hand side of your screen. One can see the lateral ventricles that then merge into the third ventricle which is a midline structure. It is bordered on either side by the hypothalamus and lateral to that the internal capsule and the thalamus. I'm sorry, the lateral, the internal capsule and the basal ganglia. Also appreciate on this image how a third ventriculostomy can be performed by traversing the cortex, the lateral ventricle, and into the third ventricle and then a hole is made at the floor of the third ventricle. I'd like to direct your attention to the image on the right hand side of your screen. This is a sagittal view of the brain with the third ventricle in the middle. It is important to understand the anatomic relationship of the anterior commissure and the optic nerve and optic chiasm, pituitary body, and also the mammillary bodies. When performing a third ventriculostomy for hydrocephalus, a hole is made anterior to the mammillary bodies and posterior to the pituitary body. Appreciate in this view how inferior to the third ventricle, there is a potential space that is in front of the brainstem as this will be important when we discuss third ventriculostomies later and the danger of injuring the basilar artery which 
courses along the front part of the brainstem. Also appreciating this picture, the corpus callosum, which forms the roof of the third ventricle. This consists of the genu, the body, and then also the splenium. So the anterior wall of the third ventricle is formed by the columns of the fornix. Uh, the fornix being involved in learning and memory. The frame in a Monroe is the connection between the third ventricle and the lateral ventricles. And then an important structure is the lamina terminalis. The lamina terminalis is a thin sheet of gray matter and pia which is between the optic chiasm as can be seen on the picture on the right hand side of your screen and the rostrum of the corpus callosum. Essentially it's the front wall of the third ventricle. This is also an important structure when treating aneurysms, especially aneurysms arising off the anterior communicating artery. Frequently after subarachnoid hemorrhage a patient may have increased intracranial pressure and an useful technique is to fenestrate the lamina terminalis and release cerebrospinal fluid which will decrease the intracranial pressure. The lateral wall of the, vent of the third ventricle is, the, is uh, bordered by the hypothalamus. This is extremely important as injury to the hypothalamus can result in loss of uh, one's ability to regulate temperature, one's drive for thirst, for food, and can be a life-threatening condition. As I've already mentioned, the floor of the third ventricle is composed of the optic chiasm, the infundibulum, and the mammillary bodies as well. I'd like to draw your attention to the picture on the right. <clears throat> as this depicts the floor of the third ventricle, this is a view through an endoscope that has been placed through the brain parenchyma into the lateral ventricle through the foramen of Monroe and is within the third ventricle. The number three highlights the area where the pituitary body is and is called the optic recess. The number two identifies the mammillary bodies and number one identifies the thin layer of the third ventricle which is fenestrated when performing a third ventriculostomy. The posterior wall is bordered by the habenular commissure and the pineal body. Here in the picture on the right, the area of the posterior wall of the third ventricle is highlighted with an arrow pointing to the pineal gland. This is an important structure as it is sometimes the site of various tumors such as pineal tumors or various pineal tumors. When there is a tumor of the pineal gland and the tumor enlarges this compresses the tegmentum which is below the pineal gland in this picture. As that occurs the cerebral aqueduct is occluded and that can result in non-communicating, I'm sorry, that can result in commun in hydrocephalus that can be life-threatening. Moving on to the fourth ventricle, which is depicted on the left side of your screen. The fourth ventricle lies posterior to the brainstem and anterior to the cerebellum. The number one highlights the superior medullary velum. This is 